So like this has become central to your personality in a way, and you're almost experiencing a sort of imposter syndrome where you feel like the focal point or one of the focal points of your life, of your history, of your story, your narrative, that it might be a lie. And, and I wonder if that imposter syndrome thing kind of sits with you because uh, I think there are a lot of people that feel that way. Like it's, they're going to come to this realization that it's all been a big lie and all this pain has been for nothing, that it's been blown out of proportion or you made it up or something like that. Hey, everybody. Before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 287. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people, just like you. And today I have a question and answer episode. Um, Two really good questions. Uh, These are questions that do have to do with um, trauma. Um, Nothing explicit, but both of them do involve trauma. I know there's been a lot of questions that involve trauma recently, but man, it's a (laughs) unfortunately very common thing. And it's something that a lot of people deal with. And so, I mean, part of uh, me taking questions about this is because it's complex and multifaceted and um, there's a lot to talk about with regards to trauma. You know, another reason I tend to take a lot of questions about it is to normalize the experience of, of being traumatized by something and, you know, having a hard time with that. Um, it's, it's a real thing. And so I don't want people to feel alone in that. And also just the volume of questions, you know, if you, if I were to make a graph, um, about the different topics, uh, trauma, PTSD would definitely be up there in terms of, you know, uh, frequency of questions asked. So yeah, um, hopefully this isn't going to be too repetitive. I don't think it will be. Um, there's some interesting nuance to the questions here, but they do both involve trauma again, nothing graphic, but if that's something that you're just like not feeling today, you're not up for, feel free to, you know, get out of here for now and come back another time if you feel up to it. Um, I am, I feel like last week I was a little worn out. I don't exactly remember (laughs) the time is flying by. It's hard to keep things straight. Um, today I'm, I'm kind of a little bummed. It's been a little bit of a heavy day for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, one of which has to do with work and, you know, part of my job is giving, uh, feedback to people about the results of testing that I do. And sometimes it's great. Sometimes I can tell them really good news and help them understand how to adapt their life. And other times I'm telling them, you know, you have a degenerative brain condition that's going to get worse over the next few years and eventually you're going to die by complications of it. And I don't say it in that way. Um, people are usually very satisfied with the feedback that I give them, even when it's bad news, but it, it, uh, you know, it is harder than the other types. That among, you know, other things in life have me feeling just kind of like blah right now. So uh, the show must go on. I'm going to do my best to show up for you guys. And I still really do want to address these questions. Uh, But if you hear that hint in my voice, uh, you're not you're not imagining it. Um, Before I get into the questions, I did also want to just thank you guys. One thing that that came up this week, which was really cool and interesting was um, my wife had seen, uh, I think it was an email or no, she was she was on audible doing something and it was like in the suggested uh books and books that were like uh self-help books with irreverent humor or something to that effect or bad language whatever and my anxiety book was on there and after all these years the fact that my my anxiety book continues to be you know on these lists and suggested and and sometimes higher up in the charts and things like that um it's really humbling and i I really appreciate every single one of you that's listened or read or shared it with somebody else um, that goes for any of my books. You know, the the anxiety one was a, was the flagship one, and I do want you guys to know that I am still writing. Um, life makes it a little bit more difficult to write consistently. I have a big chunk of an anxiety workbook done. I need to continue cracking away at. I'm already working on the next journal prompts book, um, so I have stuff in progress. But um, yeah, you know, if you if you're out there and you've consumed really any of my content, but especially the writing, thank you. I really appreciate it. It, it it's 
fundamentally changed the course of my life in terms of my career and things like that. And it allows me to have more flexibility to do things like the podcast, to take my kids to school every day, things like that. So I really, really appreciate you. Um, wow. That turned out to be a little bit deeper than I anticipated. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get into the questions. Uh, so here's the first one. Okay, so first question reads, Dear Dr. Duff, I have a somewhat specific question. I'm in therapy for childhood trauma no one but the abuser knows about. Years of physical and verbal abuse. Me and my therapist discovered I have a strong need to create reminders for myself that my trauma really happened. I do this with self-harm and cannot let it go. I have an irrational and somewhat intrusive thought uh, and fears saying that if I stop self-harming, I'm admitting the trauma never happened. I can go several weeks without harming myself, but eventually the voice in my head starts nagging me. My therapist says I'm putting up a memorial for everyone to see since no one in my life knows about the trauma. Also, I turned out okay. I'm quite successful, and that's great, of course, but it's not helpful with this need for reminders. There's nothing about my life that would imply anything bad ever happened to me. Have you ever heard of anything like this? What would you recommend? My therapist admitted she's never encountered anything like it, but we'll do some research to see how we can approach this. Thank you, and have a nice weekend. So yeah, uh, really good question. Thank you for this. It's a very interesting question. And as always with questions related to trauma, especially childhood stuff, uh, thank you for trusting me with it. I do want to say that I believe you. That's a simple thing to say, but I I want to make sure that I say it. I believe you. Um, It's a maddening situation to, to have your own mind telling you that your experience is incorrect or wrong. And so I just want to, you know, be able to reassure you that um, I believe, you know, what happened to you and in the way that it impacted you. Um, I do want to say, first off, that doubting your own experience and your memory of what happened is totally normal. Uh, it's a common situation, especially when nobody else knows about it, when nobody else knows what happened, as you said. Um, and if you've had any continued contact with your abuser, you know, whether that's now or in the past around when it happened in the, in the time following when it happened, they, the abuser, are certainly going to be motivated to minimize that abuse, right? Um, they're going to say that, oh, that's not what happened, or you, you're making it a bigger deal than it was, or you're crazy. They want to make you feel like the crazy one. And that's very often a part of that cycle of abuse that keeps you in that cycle. So it is common, and in a situation like this, it, it would be um, very common for somebody to try to minimize that if they're, you know, trying to clear their own conscience or not be in trouble, all sorts of things like that. And, you know, without other sources of validation, you know, without other people saying, oh, yeah, I, I understand that this is what happened to you, you're sort of left to just doubt your own experience. And that can be isolating, it can be confusing. When nobody knows what happened, you're sort of left on your own with this. Um, I like to think of mental health issues in general as um, their own entity or their own organism. You know, sometimes I kind of picture them like with depression. I often think of it as like this black sludge that's clinging to your body. Um, And, you know, mostly any organism out there in the world is going to try to keep itself protected and alive so that it can fulfill its purpose. Right. Whether that's reproduction or, you know, whatever that organism's purpose is, it's going to try to stay alive long enough to do that. And so for you, you know, with, with your traumatic experience, filling you with doubts, filling you with uncertainty is one of the ways that your trauma gets to keep itself secret and sacred and locked away in this box that you're scared to open up. You know, I said, it's like the, uh, last, I think last episode or two episodes ago, I said, it's like the uh, restricted section of the library with these big, scary books that have monsters in them and little padlocks on top and all of that. And so, you know, your, your trauma wants to be that way. It wants to be basically up on a pedestal you know, uh, thought of as this dangerous thing that you're scared to open up and it gives it a whole lot of credit and potentially a whole lot of power over you and your behaviors. I think what your therapist said is really interesting about this being, you know, the self-harm being a memorial so that everybody can see that your trauma indeed did happen since nobody really knows about it. And I think there are elements of that that are plausible. Um, you know, one thing I would ask is, is whether your, you know, self-harm is very evident to people. Um, you know, is it truly a memorial? Is it something that you are in one way or another showing to people? Um, regardless, I think, I think it's a really interesting interpretation and worth digging into. But there's also another aspect to it that you might think of. Um, there's a phenomenon in psychology where you sort of feel the need to justify the emotions that you're feeling or the difficulty that you're having. 
and you'll interpret what happened um, differently because of what you feel. So in other words, you know, in this situation, you know how much you've struggled from the way that this trauma has impacted you. And, and I'm making some assumptions here, um, but you know, you know the way this trauma has impacted you. So it would be devastating for you to realize, in big air quotes there, to, to realize that it was all for nothing because it, you know, your pain was based on something that never happened or it wasn't as bad as you made it out to be. Right. So you feel like you need to feel some sort of um, some sort of pain. Right. Um, so like this has become central to your personality in a way. And you're almost experiencing a sort of imposter syndrome where you feel like the focal point or one of the focal points of your life, of your history, of your story, your narrative, that it might be a lie. And, and I wonder if that imposter syndrome thing kind of sits with you because uh, I think there are a lot of people that feel that way. Like it's, they're going to come to this realization that it's all been a big lie and all this pain has been for nothing, that it's been blown out of proportion or you made it up or something like that. And again, I think that's, that's trauma's attempt to sort of keep itself safe. Another thing that struck me here, and you kind of, I think, are tuning into this with the way that you asked your question. Um, but another thing that struck me here is how similar... Um, the pattern you're experiencing is to what you might see in somebody with OCD, so obsessive compulsive disorder. Now I'm talking about OCD, not OCPD. So not like uh, finicky and very uh, orderly and um, fastidious about things. I'm talking about, you know, obsessions, compulsions. Um, you often have compulsive behaviors, so like repetitive things or things that you can't stop yourself from doing. And in OCD, they don't have to be, but they are often tied to an obsessive, intrusive thought. So in this case, if you look at it with that frame, your obsessive thought would be that your trauma never happened, right? It's, it's intrusive. You don't want to think this, but it, it sneaks into your mind and it kind of smacks you across the face like, hey, your trauma is a lie. And so you have this obsessive thought that your trauma never happened. And the compulsive behavior that's, that's linked to that is the self-harm. There are lots of different examples of how this would show up in people with OCD. Uh, for instance, a simple one might be like if somebody doesn't call their mom uh, before going to bed or maybe call their mom repetitively, you know, they need to call and check, call and check, call and check. They're convinced that their mom's going to die while they're, while they're asleep or something like that. So that would be kind of a, a, another similar example. Um, and they're not logically tied together, but in your mind, those wires are crossed, so they feel like they're tied together. And so that compulsion gives you some temporary relief from the obsessive thought and the anxiety that that obsessive thought causes, but it doesn't truly solve it, right? Because you're not addressing the underlying issue. It's just a sort of very temporary fleeting sense of relief. Um, and now there's this, I want to talk about a different, different aspect of this. Um, there's another interesting way that that whole justification thing I talked about just a minute ago could be playing out, you know, where you try to justify your experience and, and what you're feeling. Uh, the other way that it could be playing out is if you weren't actually as traumatized as you would think you would be, uh, given what you've been through. So if you weren't actually traumatized by it, um, and I don't want to say this in, a, in any way that, that minimizes what happened to you. It's terrible, right? So was what happened um, terrible? Yes. Did it affect you? Uh, certainly. I'm sure it changed things in your life. That doesn't necessarily mean that it was traumatic for you, though. Um, it's something that could easily cause many people trauma. You know, I think a, a lot of people going through what you have been through would be traumatized by it, but it's such an individualized basis, right? So let's say that perhaps uh, what happened to you made an impact on who you are as a person, definitely shaped your personality, how you perceive the world, things like that. But, you know, as you mentioned, you've been able to do really well for yourself. Maybe you're not sitting here with flashbacks, with you know, really strong triggers with emotional lability, meaning kind of flip-flopping emotions without hypervigilance, without other symptoms that would be characteristic of something like PTSD or another traumatic response. How could that be, right? Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of what your automatic thought might be. This was so terrible, I should be feeling a lot from it. But I've said this so many times recently, going back to Laura Copley's episode on the, on the show, you know, trauma isn't what happened. It's your body's response to it. So there are you know, people that uh, can go through really horrendous things and not be traumatized by it, not because they didn't care, but just because that specific little groove in their brain is, is resilient to that. Whereas maybe a different thing that would not be traumatic to somebody else would be traumatizing for you. And when I say traumatizing, I don't mean that it was hard. I mean, it caused traumatic symptoms. So things like I was just talking about, basically, you know, kind of going through the criteria of PTSD. So, you know, you might think to yourself, how could that be? If I'm not actively suffering actively in each moment, does that mean that it really wasn't that big of a deal? 
because I should be feeling something with all that I've been through. It was, it was a huge deal, so it should feel that way. I hope you see what I'm getting at here, right? The self-harm can be your mind's way of justifying the intensity of what you experienced in the absence of other really significant traumatic symptoms if, if you don't have them. Um, and as long as there's some sort of serious physical impact, right? You know, the self-harm giving you actual wounds, you can feel justified in the magnitude of what happened to you. Now, this isn't logical, right? This is like an illusory correlation. Again, we're kind of getting back to the OCD type stuff where these things aren't exactly linked, but it feels like a justification of it. It feels like, okay, if I'm feeling this much pain, that means what happened to me was real. And so in a certain backwards way, it kind of might just make sense to you. So I'm telling you these things, um, you know, these different possibilities. I realize I threw out a few different things here with the hope that it might help you adjust the way that you're approaching things, especially because you are in therapy with somebody who's hearing you out, with somebody who is um, trying to, you know, do more research on this. If you wanted to share this episode with them, you're, you're more than welcome to. Uh, I'm not telling you that they are doing a, a bad job or using the incorrect approach, but um, sometimes more different perspectives can be helpful to shake things up. And, and, and maybe one of these ways of looking at it will really make sense and resonate to you. So it could be that, for instance, um, you know, if we're taking the kind of OCD route of the obsessive thought about, you know, your trauma never having occurred and the compulsion of the self-harm, maybe we need to use a response that would be more uh, based in like the treatment for OCD. So something like exposure and response prevention. And, you know, your therapist could kind of work with you on that. Or maybe simply recognizing the fact that uh, you can have terrible things happen to you, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be traumatized by them. Maybe that can help you break this link that we were just talking about. And just a simple understanding the insight about it can be really helpful to you. Um, but one thing that you can definitely try out is talking about your experience. So again, you know, consider your trauma, if, if you do have trauma here, you know, but the, the experience that happened to you and your, your response to it, consider that to be its own, you know, organism. And by dragging it out into the light, by talking about it, you take away its power to be the secret shameful thing. So sharing your story with more people might be a really powerful part of your recovery here. Um, maybe it's not going to be the most comfortable or safe feeling thing or legitimately unsafe, right? I don't know your family structure. I don't know what you have going on around you. Um, so sometimes it's not safe to talk about these things with certain people. But um, if it's not comfortable for you to talk about this with people you already have in your life, what about something like a group? There are lots of groups out there for trauma survivors. You know, these days they are both in person and online. One of the great things about online is that, you know, if it's a legitimate therapy group, you can, you can, um, attend from anywhere within the state. And if it's more of a peer led group, that's not considered, you know, therapy, not group therapy, you can go anywhere uh, in the country or even potentially the world. So you can get online, um, even, uh, sharing anonymously, you know, there are forums, there are message boards, but talking about your experience, being validated and heard and not doubted for what you've been through can be a really, really powerful thing. And it can help to take take some of the edge off of that nagging voice that tells you what you went through was not actually uh, true. Um, and with that, you know, I think it's a great opportunity for you to recognize that you don't have to be actively struggling in your life to make good use of something like therapy or group therapy. Um, if you're doing great overall, but this thing is just a sticking point, cool. It's a great opportunity for you to embrace that, to, you know, use the productive direction of your life to make things even better sharing your story, hearing from people with experiences that you might be able to relate to. These are things that can be healing experiences and um, help you recognize that what you experienced matters and your feelings related to it matter. So hopefully those give you some ideas to move forward. Uh, again, thank you for trusting me with the question. And I'm, you know, feel terrible that this had to happen to you in the first place. You didn't deserve it. And I believe you that it did. So good luck to you. And, uh, you know, Give your therapist some props for, uh, for, for trying hard on this. It sounds like you got a good one. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. Okay, this episode is brought to you by Acorn TV. I know a lot of you guys out there love watching TV as a way to decompress, relax after a long day. And if you're an American like me, you probably have a special affinity for British TV. Not sure what it is, the accents, the driving on the wrong side of the road, 
just the good storylines and great production, but British TV is awesome. And uh, there's a great way to get lots of amazing British TV, which is through Acorn TV. It's the largest commercial free British streaming service, and it has everything from compelling stories to originals and exclusive premieres you won't find anywhere else. They have hundreds of exclusive shows from around the world, including mysteries, dramas, comedies, history, and much, much more. Uh, They're cleverly written, visually striking, and they have actors that you're familiar with, like Mary Berry, David Tennant, Daddy Newton, people that you would recognize. Um, Every time I do one of these, I ask my mother-in-law to write me up a little review for a show that she's watched because she loves watching British TV and uses Acorn TV very frequently. So shout out to you if you're listening. Um, And this week, she said uh, she is watching Miss Fisher's Modern Mysteries. The great niece of the infamous Miss Fisher finds herself playing detective while maneuvering the 60s. The lead actress is absolutely adorable and comes across as independent, savvy, and uh, as an independent and savvy young woman. Though she often finds herself in amusing predicaments, her wit and know-how pull her out of any dire situation. So if that sounds interesting to you, you can check it out along with thousands of hours of new enthralling content in Acorn TV for a fraction of the cost of most other streaming services, such as $5.99 a month. So with Acorn TV, you can get your British fix anytime, and you can try Acorn TV for 30 days for free by going to acorn.tv and use my promo code DUFF. You have to enter the code in all lowercase, so that's A-C-O-R-N dot TV, not dot com, but dot TV, promo code D-U-F-F, all lowercase, to get your first 30 days for free. Acorn.tv, code DUFF. All right, back to the show. Okay, so question two reads, hey there, I just have a question I'm hoping you'd like to address on the podcast. A bit of background, I'm a 33-year-old woman diagnosed with bipolar 2 and borderline, and she put the ages in there, so borderline, or bipolar at age 29, borderline at age 31. Though I think the latter, meaning borderline, could be a misdiagnosis given to me while I was in the middle of a severe depressive episode. More on that later. I've been in a lot of therapy, both outpatient and inpatient, and medicated, and am in a very good place mentally. However, since the bipolar symptoms are at bay and I'm currently not in an episode, my psychiatrist wants me to go through ADHD diagnostics as concentration and other ADHD-like symptoms are still problematic and can't be explained away by a bipolar episode. However, I think these symptoms might not actually be ADHD, but trauma symptoms from childhood, uh, sexual abuse, something my therapists are aware of, but not treated or addressed directly. This is also why I think the borderline diagnosis might be incorrect, that the symptoms of trauma are being mistaken for symptoms of ADHD and borderline. Do you have any experience with similar misdiagnosis or overlapping symptoms and how to go about getting a correct diagnosis? So yeah, um, thank you for the question. Another somewhat heavy one. Um, Thank you for that. Uh, I am happy that you're alive. It sounds like you've had to endure way more than any human should. So you know, I'm glad that you're here able to ask this question. I'm also glad that you're questioning your diagnoses. I think it's totally valid and important to do so. And this is coming from somebody who's, you know, part of my job is to help arrive at diagnoses. I think it's really important to question them. You're right that sometimes diagnoses are given due to symptoms from something else. There there is overlap in symptoms. Sometimes you get, you know, false positives, uh, misinterpretations of things, all of that. And I think that these things should always be reconsidered and reevaluated. Um, one thing that unfortunately does not happen enough is removing old diagnoses from someone's problem list. And if you've ever been in like a big healthcare setting where you get an after visit summary and it shows your sort of active problems or historical problems, sometimes there's a lot of stuff on there. And rather than removing old diagnoses, old diagnoses and revising them, they just stack up more and more over time until your problem list looks like a fucking CVS receipt, right? It's just long. And so you'll have things like, you know, bipolar, mood disorder, NOS, uh, major depression, anxiety, panic disorder, agoraphobia, um, you know, adjustment disorder, this, that. And it's just like everything that's a possibility instead of being more concise and seeing what's the umbrella that might hold all of those different experiences and symptoms. Now, diagnosis is not easy. You know, it's, it's something that I think a lot of people are not, um, the most skilled in, to be honest, even people who are in the profession of, you know, maybe like a psychologist or a psychiatrist. So, you know, it, it's it's possible that some of these things have been kind of misread or misdiagnosed. And, and that's somewhat common, but that's why it's always important to just revisit it. Um, now with ADHD, so adult uh, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, I've done some episodes on this before. If you want to learn more about ADHD, just go to my website, deftthepsych.com and search ADHD um, in the search bar at the top. 
but um, you know, it's there are basically a, a few different forms of it. You can have primarily inattentive, meaning you kind of tend to have your head in the clouds. You have a hard time pointing your attention in the right direction. Doesn't mean you have no attention span. It just means you don't really have a lot of control over what you're paying attention to. So you might hyper focus on things that are considered irrelevant by other people's standards, or you know have trouble focusing on the thing that's right in front of your face that you're supposed to be focusing on. And there's a hyperactive type, which is much more about um, you know stronger behaviors, impulsivity, risk taking. As a kid, a lot of times you see it as uh, talking out of turn in class, getting up and walking around when you're not supposed to. You know, tr- trouble controlling that behavior to a to a level that would be expected, you know, inappropriate for your age, and then the combined type, which is when you have both. Um, with ADHD, there there very well may be you know uniquely adult versions of it, but most often it's something that's present from a young age and something that you can see from a young age in multiple settings, right? So not just at school, but maybe at school and home, or you know, at multiple different uh, people's houses, your grandparents' house, your house, um, you know, multiple settings where it's not just the unique interaction between you and that setting that's causing the issues. It's something that's persistent in other places of your life. Now for you, I'm not sure how far back your trauma goes. You said it was in childhood, um, but you might consider, did you have any symptoms of inattention before your traumatic experiences? Now, if these were, you know, um, God, I hope this wasn't the case, but as early as, you know, age seven or eight or something like that, it would be really hard to tease that apart. But if it was later on in childhood and you look back at around, you know, age six, seven, eight, and you can see that you did have these kind of ADHD type symptoms, that might be an indicator that there is something there that's underlying that isn't just caused by the trauma or other psychiatric difficulties. But yeah, it can be really, really hard to separate out things like trauma, depression, bipolar, and anxiety because they can all cause you to have trouble maintaining attention just in their own right, you know, especially as they get to the more severe end of the spectrum. You know, if you're somebody who's significantly depressed, it's really hard to pay attention, you know, and when you have really, really strong anxiety, sometimes it's like, forget about it. There's, there's nothing that you can focus on because it's just too overwhelming. So, um, you know, you want to think about that and also the, consider whether the symptoms that you're, that you're having of inattention or other, as you said, ADHD like symptoms, whether those things are causing a real functional impairment, whether they're getting in the way of your life in a significant way. That's important to consider for all of this, right? Um, you know, the only way typically that you're diagnosed with a, with like a mental disorder, a psychiatric disorder is when it really causes you to have trouble functioning. Um, otherwise, it's sort of a, a quirk. It's something that's part of your experience, but it wouldn't be a disorder if it's not causing a problem, right? So is it really getting in the way of your life? And to be clear, uh, sources of personal annoyance, quirks, things that are just um, not fun for you to live with, that's valid too. And those are worth paying attention to. But if it's really not holding you back or negatively impacting your life to a significant degree, I, I want you to ask yourself whether you really need to torture yourself digging so hard for answers unless it's fun and you enjoy doing it, you know, um, but if it's something that's, that's been hard for you to go through this process, um, you know, you're allowed to, to feel okay with where you're at. Um, I think that there are definitely in your case, there, they're going to be overlapping symptoms in the things that you're dealing with. Um, symptoms of traumatic responses like PTSD and symptoms of depression, these can definitely be mistaken for ADHD. So for instance, you know, if you have PTSD, one of your symptoms could very well be what we call hypervigilance. So sort of always scanning your environment, looking for danger, really sensitive to signs of danger, and then responding in strong, exaggerated ways to things that seem scary or threatful to you. And when you're in that state, uh, your attention gets pulled in multiple directions, right? So whenever you want to focus on something, that thing is competing for mental real estate with your hypervigilance about your environment or Uh, and or about the sensations that are happening in your own body. So there's a lot that's competing for your attention. And then you're saying, hey, focus on this movie or this class or this book you're trying to read or this conversation you're having, whatever. That's tough to do. Um, And then again, yeah, depression, that can also cause attentional difficulties. Um, It can cause trouble concentrating in its own right, but it can also make it uh, more difficult for you to care to put in all the effort that you should put into or that you would like to put into tasks. Um, so, you know, with depression, you can find yourself just like not able to pull it together and really not feeling too bad about that. It's just like, whatever, who cares? Right. And so with that, that can look a lot like uh, decreased attention. 
Um, all this is to say that, you know, for you, the diagnostic picture is definitely murky. It's not clear. And there are lots of overlapping symptoms. So it's, it's not unheard of in a situation like yours to have some trouble figuring out what is what. Um, you know, one thing you should know um, when it comes to getting evaluated for ADHD, the actual diagnosis process for ADHD doesn't really rely so much on objective measures. So on like performance-based measures, things that you're doing in an office to see how your attention is. Those things do exist. So there are tests of attention um, and they help to show issues like impulsivity and also things like lack of vigilance, meaning how careful you are over time. And these would be things like what you call continuous performance tasks or CPTs. Um, some people who are listening may have been tested for ADHD before and, and done these, but there are a variety of different ones. Uh, the most common type generally is on a computer and you have some sort of target, like you have either numbers or letters. And every time you see your target, if it's like say an X or the number one, you have to hit the space bar or click. So you, you know, hit the space bar every time you see it. And it's long and boring. So it's over a number of minutes, you know, um, and they really tax your attention over time to see, are you accidentally being impulsive and hitting the space bar for things that are not your target? Or are you being inattentive and missing targets because you've been just paying attention for too long and that's taxed your attention and you don't have anything left? Um, and so those are, those are, you know, continuous performance tasks. There are other ones that are kind of more paper and pencil that have a similar vibe to them. Um, and those are things that, um, you know, uh, are often included in the process for diagnosing ADHD. But the thing is you can have somebody with ADHD that aces these tests, right? One thing when I was working, um, at a healthcare facility in the past during my internship was there, there was a, uh, they, they would administer the continuous performance tasks, the CPTs to people who are being diagnosed or, you know, trying to be diagnosed with ADHD. And the person who would administer them was not really a clinician. They were like a, uh, um, like a clerical person. And so they didn't really know about it, but it's very simple. You kind of set them up, you tell them the rules and you start it. But they were sort of changing the way that they would talk about the rules, which is a big no-no in cognitive testing because they're very, very standardized. And so this person was saying, oh, it's like a video game. You know, you just hit it every time it goes up, pretend like it's a blaster or something like that. I don't remember the exact words he used, but with that frame, a kid with ADHD that loves video games might be like, they might zero in on it and hyper-focus and just knock the thing out of the park, right? Even though they have attentional problems in other settings. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can have people with ADHD who ace those tests. You can also have people that perform very poorly on a continuous performance task and don't have ADHD. So they are not diagnostic. Those are, that You can't look at a, a performance on that and say, okay, this person has ADHD. They're just additional info. They're additional information that you pull in with other things. Um, and truly, ADHD assessment is more focused on looking at things like your personal history, your grades. That's one thing that a lot of people, um, you know, like in primary care don't do, which is like some investigative work, looking at, you know, history of, of grades, you know, behavior ratings in class, all sorts of things like that, work history. Um, they, there are forms that are like behavior rating forms. So you can have your parent or a boss or a teacher or a roommate kind of rate your behavior and, and talk about whether they see certain things that are that are indicative of ADHD and you see how well those sort of correlate. And those are all part of the process as well as just ruling out other possible diagnoses. Somebody who has epilepsy, for instance, is going to potentially have periods where they zone out and that's not them having attention problems, that's them having, you know, little absence seizures. So you want to rule things out as well. Um, but, you know, cognitively, you do um, tend to see trouble on attentional tasks. Uh, you tend to see executive functioning difficulties. Executive functioning means higher level thinking skills like mental organization, multitasking, you know, putting things in a sequence, stuff like that. Um, but that's only one piece of the puzzle, and that's not actually required for a diagnosis. You can have all the signs of it. You can have, you know, the behavior that people indicate, you know, is indicative of it and not really show too many signs on, on you know, cognitive testing and still really qualify for a diagnosis of ADHD. Sometimes when you're smart and you're generally a high performer, you might fly under the radar as well when it comes to the testing, just because you have a lot of horsepower to work with. So all of that said, you know, I know I'm kind of probably turning you off from the idea of getting assessed, but all of that said, getting a cognitive assessment or a neuropsychological assessment, those can be very helpful in that they help you to better understand your strengths and your weaknesses. You can learn what is and is not an issue for you when it comes to how you're thinking and how your brain's working. And this can enable you to better organize or adapt your life. Um, it can help lead or guide you toward different treatments with your providers. 
And that's regardless of the source of these issues, right? So even if you don't have ADHD, but you do in practice have attentional issues due to these other conditions, that's still worth paying attention to. That's still worth, um, you know, adjusting to maybe making some modifications to your environment or work, uh, even getting accommodations at times. You know, if you don't have ADHD, but it turns out that you have horrendous attention and that affects your ability to read quickly and you're going to be taking a standardized test. Yeah, it might be totally valid for you to get extra time or another way to, you know, have an adaptive scenario where you can um, better perform on the test. Um, so yeah, it's still worth considering. And sometimes the cognitive assessment can be helpful in ways that you may not even expect. Um, getting a correct diagnosis is helpful in some respects, but it's really not everything. I think that learning more about the functional impact, you know, how things actually play out in your life is probably more helpful. And even, you know, uh, pushing to find the perfect name for it and the perfect name of, uh, you know, the perfect source rather of each symptom, where each symptom is coming from, that may not be the most useful thing. It's more about the actions that you might take that could be important here. Now, you said that your trauma is something that is known about but not actively treated or worked on. I'm curious about that. I, I think that um, getting some focused treatment with somebody who is trained in working with trauma, you know, a psychologist or a therapist that works with trauma, that could be a next logical step here. Um, sometimes it's only over time and with effective treatment that we can start to tease apart where our symptoms come from. And, you know, that time and treatment are actually part of the diagnosis process. A lot of people don't realize that. And that goes for a variety of, of, of issues. But like in my work, if I'm working with people who I suspect might have a degenerative condition that's getting worse over time, sometimes waiting a year or two is part of that diagnosis process so I can see the trajectory over time. Um, and this is, again, why I said diagnoses should be revised and refined over time. There are life circumstances, there are physical health things, there's all sorts of stuff that could be potentially playing a role in somebody's presentation. And so they should be revised, they should be revisited, all that's very important. Now, there's also the issue of medication. I'm not sure if you're on any medications. Oh, you said you are, I think, right? You said that you are... I'm getting the two mixed up. Um, can't see... Maybe you didn't say that you're on medication. Eh, whatever, regardless. Um, I'm not sure. If you are on medication, um, there are some possibilities where the medication would be causing you to have some changes in your thinking abilities. So for instance, in many cases, uh, anticonvulsant medications are used. So these are medications that are designed to treat seizures, but they can be used for a variety of things from anxiety to bipolar. And if you think about you know, uh, how a seizure works, these medications are intended to help your brain stop working so quickly you know with seizures essentially like a fast-paced electrical storm in your brain and these medications try to slow that down and stop it from getting out of hand so you know as a result they can cause some slower processing and sometimes attentional issues um, for instance gabapentin is a really common one gabapentin operates on gaba um, which is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in your brain meaning it, it slows things down and so, um, yeah, that's one that could definitely cause it, depending on the dosage, depending on your response to it, it could cause some changes in the way that you think. And that would be considered okay in a lot of cases if it's necessary for your other issues. You know, there's no free lunch when it comes to changing chemicals in your brain. So everything's going to have your primary effect, and there's also potentially going to be side effects. And you just have to balance out whether that's worth it or not. So, you know, all in all, there are many different threads here, and I think it might be a little bit unreasonable for you to take every single individual symptom and try to find a nice clean cut way to explain where they come from, because there is so much overlap in the various issues you deal with. But I think what you can do is continue working toward ruling things out. You know, if you don't think that you have borderline, definitely honor that, you know, express your concern to your providers. If you need to get a second opinion from somebody that has more experience working with personality disorders, then, you know, go do that. Absolutely. But overall, I think it's totally valid to, you know, take a step back from the labeling and take steps toward coping, treatment, adjusting your life and your day-to-day -day experience based on what you're actually seeing, right? Regardless of what it might be called. So hopefully those thoughts are, are helpful to you. You know, both of these, I'm trying to give you kind of just some things to think about, food for thought, ways that you might approach this. Um, but thank you for the questions, really brave questions. Um, if you guys want to send in a question for a future episode of the show, uh, shoot me an email to duffthepsych at gmail.com. If you want to see the full show notes, uh, go to depthofpsych.com slash episode 287. And I uh, hope you guys are taking really good care of yourselves. I appreciate your attention, and I will see you for the next episode. Bye.